It's high time for us to turn to our first keynote uh, speech. Uh, today, uh, we are very pleased to uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. Andy Merrifield to come over to deliver his uh, keynote speech. Uh, Andy, maybe perhaps I just read out of the booklet. Uh, he, he hasn't agreed on that. Uh, I just read it, read it out. Yeah. Andy is an urban theorist who received uh, his PhD in Jovi from University of Oxford, uh, more importantly, under David Harvey. Uh, prior to being, of being an independent scholar, he taught at various universities, and then drawing heavily on the work of uh, Henry Lavaf, Andy is an expert in urbanism and social theory and has published widely, uh, including the urban, new urban question in 214 and the politics of encounter uh, urban theory and protests under penetrate urbanization in 2013. Uh, in our communication, he mentioned that he is writing a few more books. So I think you would like me uh, to uh, welcome him and then listen to what he is going to tell us. Andy, thank you. coming through. Thank you. Thank you for that very nice introduction, the two introductions, in fact. Uh, I guess if you just get rid of the, uh, the minimum managerialism and the editor of a journal, uh, what Adrian says pretty much accounts for me as well. But it's, uh, it, that said, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, it's, I'm a little bit jet lagged, so I don't know quite how this is going to go. Uh, but I'll give it, a, give it a shot and see how, how things work out. But it's, it's, it's a great thrill to be here for this uh, conference, for this alternative geography conference. Even though I think we can say uh, it's not a great time to be an alternative right now, is it? You know? Is it just me? You know, looking around at the, in the wake of Brexit, you know, having the misfortune to live in the UK and travel a lot in Europe. Europe is not in good shape. Reactionary forces are at large. Nationalism pokes its head uh, very viscerally. Popularism is there. Austria was a little bit of a, 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 a last night, I think the elections in Austria was a little bit of, uh, a, a little bit of something to celebrate, I think. But celebrate alternatives, celebrating a very mainstream guy, you know, getting elected, it's, it's, we're living in, in difficult times um, to be an alternative. To be an alternative is to be somehow progressive, to be, to be left. Uh, I was in the United States uh, a few weeks ago during the elections. And uh, I was due to talk the day after the election in Philadelphia and to talk about planetary urbanization <laughs> at a conference, alternative conference, pretty much similar similar scenario to what we have here. And uh, I was, the, the evening of the election, I was, I was looking at the news and I, the writing was on the wall, I think quite early on in, in the evening about who was gonna win. But anyhow, I went to bed pretty much expecting Donald Trump to win. And I, I just couldn't, I was a bit jet lagged, so I was up very early, about 3 a.m. I decided just to check my, my, you know, my computer to see, you know, and then, I, and then I saw it, you know, President-elect Donald Trump. So I thought, oh, shit, you know, not good news, frankly. So I went back to bed, and uh, I was lying awake thinking that, actually, what am I going to say about planetary urbanization the next day to an essentially American audience, an essentially progressive lefty audience? in the wake of, of this news. And people were pretty much stunned uh, at, at the conference. But when I was lying awake in bed, I was just, got, my mind was going, all weird things were happening to, my, to what, what I was thinking about what I could say in the light of this news. And what came to mind was something a little bit peculiar. I started to think of the French philosopher, not only Lefebvre, but another French philosopher, a guy called Gilles de Deleuze. Uh, I think Deleuze is well enough 
known in, in geography to assume that some of you have some sense of who this guy is. The guy died in 1995. He was a slightly younger generation than Henri Lefebvre. Uh, and uh, what was going through my mind in, in Philadelphia, lying in bed, somewhat restless, somewhat perturbed, somewhat anxious about what the hell I was going to talk about the next day, uh, was something that Deleuze did in the late 80s. I don't know whether any of you have seen this series of interviews that he gave under the rubric Abbe Seder. About eight hours of interviews that he did with a journalist from, from uh, Liberation, a, a woman called Claire um, Parnay. And the Abbe Seder is when Deleuze extemporizes through the alphabet. So he goes from A, animal, and he finishes with Z, zigzag. And he goes through every letter. And she says, OK, you know, we've got A, animal. And then he comes to G. And G in, 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 in French would be gauche, left. And the question that Parnay poses to Deleuze, and this was all unrehearsed. This is not a TED talk. And this is what makes it very interesting, because he's extemporizing. He's thinking on his feet. It's not canned, it's not programmed, it's not auto cue. It's spoken by a great intellect thinking things through. And she says to him, you know, what do you mean by left? What is it to you to be left? Être de gauche. What does it mean to be left? And this was what was going through my head, is that what does it mean to be left, given what's going on today? What does it mean to be alternative today, given what's going on? And Deleuze, says some quite interesting things. He says, ah, he has a very gravelly voice. I, could I, can, I can impersonate him a little bit, but I won't today too much. Uh, he says, ah, you know, left. Left isn't about being in government. There's no such thing as a left government, he says. There never will be a government that left. He says, what to be left is? To be left is what he calls, and I will try and impersonate him, Une affaire de perception. It's an affair of perception. It's a, it's a perception of how you perceive the world, how you consider the world. He says, I'll tell you what it means to be left by working through what it means not to be left. To be not left is to think of the world like your postcode. Everything revolves around your address. Everything revolves around you, my street, my house. You know, you may sort of consider the, the city, then you may consider the, the region, then you may consider the nation state, then you may consider, you know, the world. But it's, it's pushing all those things necessarily away. Obviously, the nation state comes into it a little bit here. But mainly, to be, to be not left is to push things away. And he says, to be left, être de gauche, means the opposite. It means... You begin by looking at the horizon. The horizon is vast. It's my horizon. The horizon, the planet, the continent, the nation state, the region, the city, the neighborhood, the street, moi, me. It's a complete flip side of what it means to be not left. The perception is to have your head open. It's to live with the immensity of being a planetary species, a planetary, a planetary person, is to think in terms of how what happens across the world is my problem. It's my problem. It's connected to me. The connectivity of the world is what is, what is important. And this, to me, just struck me as being in a world where the borders are shrinking, the walls are coming up, the mentality is becoming much more introverted, much more about parochial nest building and pushing people away. But actually, it's quite salutary to think the way that Deleuze is framing what it means to be left, is to keep the channels and the perspective vast, to live with this immensity. It's my immensity. It's our world. It concerns me whether I like it or not. These events, global events, are my concern. They're our concern. They're left concerns.
And they always will be left concerned because the left is going to see the commonality of these struggles, of these interconnections. These particularities coexist in the world. They coexist to make the world a whole, to make the world a planet. The streets coexist with other streets. And in a way, isn't that what the planetary urbanization debate is trying to suggest? It's trying to suggest that we, we can think about the commonalities that exist in the world. That when we start talking about when alternatives get together anywhere in the world, whether it be in Hong Kong, whether it be in Philadelphia, whether it be in London, whether it be in Sydney, whether it be in New York, whether it be in Jakarta, whether it be in Lagos, and there will be a lot of alternatives around, I have to say, too, is that they get in the same room and they start talking. You find the lingua franca normally around two things. You have a mutuality of the enemy, if you want to call it that, a particular kind of form of capitalism we're living in, and assorted ruling classes that are doing things to cities. And we have an affinity of, of, of hope as well. And I think that idea, that mutuality of being on the end of a certain form of disenfranchisement, on the end of a certain form of dispossession, on the end of a certain form of, of, of oppression, coupled with the fact that actually what unites alternatives is this kind of kinship we have, this affinity of a certain kind of hope, of a certain notion of hope, a certain notion of connectivity, that we share things in common, and for me, the debates around planetary urbanization in a world where the, we're seeing the borders and the walls come up and the border patrols becoming a little, bit more, a little bit more menacing, that it's important just that we consider that way in which Deleuze was framing events. So that's my little kind of thing that I still think stands today that we have to keep our channels of communication open against all odds. And for me, when I read the work of somebody like Henri Lefebvre, the other French dude around these issues, and when he starts talking about the, the coming of urban society, when Henri Lefebvre announces the coming of urban society in 1970 and this notion of planetary urbanization, then what he's doing is, is, is positing a, a very weird dialectic, in a sense, for lefties. Because what he's suggesting here is that this urban revolution is a revolution that's essentially perpetrated by ruling classes. It's a revolution from above. It's what Gramsci would call a passive revolution. But in another way, it's also a revolution that is producing this planetary configuration, this planetary geography that cities are looking a lot more like. They, have, they, they share a lot of the same problems. And what Lefebvre was trying to suggest here is that this commonality was coming about as an undertow of an event that was categorized by a particular form of capitalism. That his interest in cities and his interest in planetary urbanization was foremost about a concern about what was going on in capitalism. So when he announces this idea of the coming of urban society and the first line of the Urban Revolution, a book that was published in 1970, when he talks about the complete urbanization of society, he says, today, something like it's, 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 it's virtual, tomorrow it'll be a reality. What I think he was doing there with this idea, with this, with this thesis, was to suggest that this is something that he didn't necessarily want to happen. I think he was, he, he, was, he was warning us of this very menacing process of urbanization, not taking over the world, because he's not talking about the idea that all green space will become gray and everywhere will become bricks and mortar. He's suggesting that there's a particular dynamic in post-war capitalism that is less and less concerned about production of commodities, that still takes place. It's less and less concerned with industrial production. Granted, that still takes place. 
less and less concern with agricultural production. Granted, that still takes place. But it's more and more concerned with the actual production of space. That the idea that space now is itself a commodity. And this form of capitalism capitalizes on the production of space. That space itself, geography is itself, is a, is a financial asset that can be tapped, that can be monetized, that can be marketized, that can be capitalized. And we know what kind of capitalism that leads to. It leads to quite an extractive form of capitalism. It's based around ground rents, property prices, interest rates, merchant capital. It doesn't necessarily function primarily through the production of industrial commodities. Of course, that still goes on at a huge degree. But most investment, and a lot of investment that goes on in urban areas now is investment into real estate, investment into, in, into capitalizing land, making land pay, extractive forms of capitalism. It's also an extractive form uh, that, that, deals, that tries to valorize the public realm too. That what we're talking about isn't just, isn't just investment in space, it's also in, in, in some way trying to capitalize on the public realm, public resources, public infrastructure. Which doesn't mean to say that there's no such thing as the public, it's just to say that actually a lot of it now has become marketized, capitalized, privatized. So this particular form of capitalism for Henri Lefebvre was what was interesting in him in cities. That cities were telling us something about the particular dynamic of contemporary capitalism. That's why they were important. The urban society, urban society was important not because of some particular whim, but because of a particular importance around politics and economics and struggle. Important that we bear that in mind. The debates around planetary urbanization crop up often in Henri Lefebvre's work. But actually, if we look at the language that he uses in some of his writings, then he frames it in an actually quite interesting way. Because the language in French isn't necessarily about planetary urbanization. It's the opposite. He talks about planetarisation de l'urbain. It's very hard to say in English, actually. It's easy to say in French. It kind of rolls off your tongue a little bit. Planetary, planetarization of the urban. He's not saying urbanisation de la planète. He's saying the opposite, planetarisation de l'urbain. Which is an interesting thing to think about that phraseology, because what he's suggesting, it seems to me, sort of, is that if we think of capitalism as this planetary beast now, if we think about it in its most extractive form, then this notion of extraction also means it needs to be fueled. So it's a kind of vortex. That the, the planet offers certain raw material, including labor power, including culture, information, capital, money, knowledge. All of that gets sucked into this vortex of the urban. The urban system utilizes it in ways it can. It can. What it doesn't need, it dispenses with. And the verb that Henri Lefebvre uses in French is called expulser, to expel. It expels what it doesn't need. It expels stuff that it's, it's, it's dispensed with. It uses labor power to a degree. It doesn't need it, and it spits it out. So what we have here is a very, very destabilizing system that utilizes certain kinds of material, including human material. When it doesn't need it, it spits it out. And I think we can see that with the way in which cities now are growing. Because it's this very expulsion process, this somehow expelling people and resources that makes the urban spread. It sucks things in, it spits things out. It secretes what Henri Lefebvre says, a residue. It's a very interesting language, isn't it? The language he's using. The secretion of a residue. I've got news for you, that's us. We are the residue. The alternative are usually the residue. We're the ones that are being sucked out. We're the ones we can't afford to live in the center of the city. We have to kind of hustle on the periphery, you know. We don't earn enough money. Universities don't pay that much. Independent scholars don't earn that much money. You have to kind of hustle it out in the banlieue of your selected city. 
And the idea is, you know, that this, this notion of secreting a residue is that the residues somehow are everywhere. The residue are the product of an extractive capitalism. Human residue, human refugees. It's not just refugees from political, political upheavals and civil wars, but from economic processes of everyday life, from the normal operation of the land market. Nothing personal, but you know, you haven't got the money to afford the rent or the property, you're, you're out of here, you know? And, and so the cities, the big cities, you know, cities I'm sure like Hong Kong and London and New York and everywhere are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and obviously it's cheaper and cheaper and cheaper for the moment. And suddenly they become incorporated into the urban dynamic and the city grows and it becomes this, this incredibly amorphous urban mosaic that incorporates all kinds of hinterlands and no longer is it a traditional city, and no longer is it a traditional countryside. It's either and both, it's both. And this is the mosaic, this is the kaleidoscope that we're seeing with planetary urbanization. This idea of residue is something that goes back a, a long way in, in the work of Henri Lefebvre. He wrote a book in the 1960s, five years before the urban revolution, 1965, a book called Metaphilosophy. Now, Metaphilosophy was Henri Lefebvre's takedown of traditional philosophy. That his notion of overcoming philosophy, overcoming traditional philosophy with a more practical and much more radicalized philosophy. The point is, you know, not to interpret the world, but to change it. That kind of idea from Marx's 11th thesis of Feuerbach. That this notion of overcoming, so the meta-philosophy was overcoming traditional philosophy. If you apply that perspective to thinking about cities, the notion of the urban revolution was similarly coming, overcoming the traditional city. It's the idea of overcoming, transforming, a destabilizing process that's full of many, many hazards, a lot of menace, but some imminent, imminent possibilities. The imminent possibilities that come up from the production of residues being secreted by this process. Every totalizing system, Henri Lefebvre suggests, like global capitalism, like planetary capitalism, secretes its other, willy-nilly. Every system that tries to plan, that tries to rationalize, will secrete a form of irrationality and a form of spontaneity. Every bureaucracy will secrete a form of deviance. Every form of order will secrete a form of disorder. So on and so forth. This other gets secreted. And the point about this, the leakiness of a totalizing system always gives rise to alternatives, to residues who get secreted from that system. If we were to think about the politics of that, then the hope for planetary urbanization, I think, is how all those particular residues globally can somehow find a way in which they can discover their own commonality, irrespective of language, irrespective of culture. I won't say irrespective of class, because I think there is a class line going on here, but it's certainly irrespective of nationality. And one of the reasons he points to the, nations, to, to the, to the urban rather than a nation state is that he sees it as a lot more of a progressive concept. So the right to the city in this sense, is the way in which residues can reclaim, or even claim for the first time, their right to some form of urban life. A form of urban life that they've been dispossessed from. A form of urban life that they've been disenfranchised from. And so the right to the city, we can see it as an appeal cry and demand, if you want to use his own, own language, on the behalf of this constituency that we can call the residue. Who are the residue? I don't think you have to have a huge amount of imagination to think about it. Obviously, I mentioned refugees. We've got plenty of refugees that are residues. We've got plenty of people who, uh, you know, who are sans papier, who are stateless, homeless, in, 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 in every sense, politically and in terms of, of, of physical homeland. We've got residues who are somehow expelled from the labor process, 
we've got you know the, the precariat, we've got the, the gig economy workers, we've got the contingent laborers, we've got people who work piecemeal, part-time workers, we've got people who can't afford to live, who have the house repossessed. Residues exist in a developing world as well as the uh, developed countries. You know, the United States has a lot of residues. And a lot of residues voted for Donald Trump. A lot of residues voted for Donald Trump. That's the bad news about residues. Residues are hurting. They don't see anybody rounding them up and saying things about citizenship. They get twitchy. They're worried about their jobs. They're worried about their future. You get demagogues come over and promise them to deliver the, the, you know, all these glorious, this glorious radiant future, then you know, they say, you're my man. You're my man. I think it's very interesting to think that, just imagine that Hillary Clinton didn't get the Democratic nomination. Bernie Sanders got the Democratic nomination. He would have been a much better candidate for the Democrats. How many people who ticked the box for, for Donald Trump would have just moved one space up and ticked the box for Bernie Sanders? I, I think quite a lot, actually. So I think there's a fluidity to residues, which is once, at once dangerous, but also full of lots of possibility and isn't quite as depressing as it may seem. That's the hope, I suspect. But the, the question of residues coming together has to be the, the way forward to rethink about the right to the city. Now, the right to the city, when Henri Lefebvre spoke about it in the 1960s, first announced in 1967. Incidentally, if anybody's thinking about an AAG conference, 50 years next year, the right to the city. <laughs> 50 years, the 50th anniversary of the right to the city, uh, which is, you know, it's a, it's a little milestone. But when he was thinking about it in 1967, he was thinking about it much more about geographical rights, geographical centrality. He pairs it up, doesn't he, with this idea of the right to centrality. And I think he really was talking about geographical centrality, about the right to, in some way, inhabit the center of the city. Obviously, the city in, he had in mind was Paris, and the way in which Paris was being dominated by, by rich bourgeois and the museum tourist industry, and it was expelling a lot of people. And that's been the historical tradition of Paris since, you know, the, since the mid-18th century, mid-19th century with, with Osman. Uh, but he was definitely thinking about this notion of centrality being geographical. I think we have to relax that a little bit now. If we're going to think of the right to the city in the planetary city, I think it's a lot more productive if we see centrality in an existential and political guise. What do I mean by that? I mean that we need to, in some way, suggest that people, I'll use the word residues. I know it's a bit unpalatable, but I use it anyway. Residues have a right to be the central to their own lives no matter where they find themselves. That's what I mean by the existential. You have a right to centrality, even if you're living in the periphery. It's important to remember that many residues are living in the core. You know, core periphery is a, it's a very arbitrary definition. You know, Greece is, you know, for many parts of, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, Greece is the core, but Greece is pretty much the periphery too. So, you know, there's a lot of residues in Greece. This idea of being the center of your own destiny. It sounds a bit corny, doesn't it? I know it does, but I, I don't want to give it up. I think it's very important for people have a right to feel at home no matter where they are. You know, Hannah Arendt talks about it beautifully in the, in the human condition. Have a look at the human condition. If you really want to be a bit, a bit geekish, have a look at page 198. And in page 198 of the human condition, she talks about the notion of the polis from the Greek city the Greek city-state. It's the University of Chicago edition, by the way. The Greek city-state. Now, the notion of the polis, contrary to what people think, isn't in the Greek mentality, and I stand to be corrected, about a physical location. It's anywhere where people communicate and act as a community. 
no matter where they find themselves and at any time. And I think what you're finding now is that a lot of urban struggles around the right to the city don't seem like they're the right to the city. So you'll get the MST and the Landless Rural Workers Movement in, in rural northeast Brazil. Is that a rural or an urban struggle? Does it matter? I suppose that's an important thing. Does it matter? It, it, it's, it's, it's a kind of, it's, it's a reaction to a form of planetary urbanization. It's a reaction to a form of extractive capitalism. You know, land grabbing goes on everywhere, whether it's green or whether it's gray. So it's a reaction here. So this notion of the polis, as Hannah Arendt formulates it, is very much around a community that can have a language that it can share, and around that language, it can act together. So it's action and communication. And it makes itself appear in the public, so-called space of appearance that Hannah Arendt posits is very important for politics. And that is the idea of a right to the city, perhaps, that we could think about it. And that leads to the political notion of it, that it's about forms of struggle, it's about forms of agitation, and about how you can agitate for the right to the city, no matter where you are. And if the rights aren't legalized, and as Jane Jacobs said many years ago, you agitate to get them, you break the law to get them. That's what you do. And I think increasingly that's going to be happening. And to some degree it's happening already in peculiar ways, this notion of urban sovereignty. It's a, it's a fascinating idea to think of citizenship around the urban, the way the Greeks thought about it. I read in the newspaper last week that Donald Trump has his, all, sorry to go on about Donald Trump, but it's really on my mind, how can it not be? Donald Trump has his, all his ideas about deporting illegal immigrants in the US, part of his manifesto, his pre-election manifesto. Right now, many, many cities throughout the United States, liberal cities, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, Boston, Philadelphia, Providence, Rhode Island is another one, have said, we're not gonna adhere to the immigration agents. We're not gonna support the Donald Trump administration Mayor Ram Emanuel of uh, Chicago said, Chicago is a sanctuary city. It's a very interesting idea, isn't it? A city of refuge. We're not going to support this very reactionary immigration policy. The city will become a, a place of sanctuary, a place of refuge. It goes back a long way. In fact, it goes back to the Old Testament. Book of Numbers talks about refuge cities. Jack Derrida, another French guy, sorry, talks about cosmopolitanism based on this idea of vie refuge, refuge cities, sanctuaries for people who are residues, who are refugees. Obviously, we can think of the refugees not just necessarily from political actions, and I think those political activities and civil wars are in some way related to planetary urbanization as well. But also just everyday economic processes, the way in which they create this relative production of residues. We could change the language from uh, labor, because it's living space as well as workspace. So the new cosmopolitanism would be a new cosmopolitanism of cities, cosmopolitanism of cities thing to say, cosmopolitanism of cities, around this idea that cities could be somehow reverted to their Greek polis tradition, and citizenship could come via the city, and they could become somehow these spaces of freedom, but also of hospitality, of humanity, of asylum, of humanitarianism. Why not think of the right to the city like this? Think about it, citizenship along these lines. It's a fascinating idea. Finally, because I think I've probably been, I've been talking a bit too long, uh, I think we can also come back to Deleuze as well. Because in these interviews, which I recommend you have a look at, they're on DVD, they're fantastic. <coughs> Abbe Seder, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. In these interviews, Abbe Seder, there's a second prong to what it means to be left. He says it is about horizon, about keeping your horizons open, 
and I think we, I'd like to think that's been a major point I've tried to make here about being cosmopolitan, having this planetary ambition, viewpoint, perspective, disposition. But the other aspect that he, he says is what he calls this idea of the process of becoming a minority. He says, you know, and he waves his finger around. He's got these very big, large fingernails. He has some problem. He couldn't get his fingers, thanks, you know. So he's waving his big fingernails around. He says, you know, the idea of never becoming government causes a certain anxiety for anybody as an alternative. The anxiety is that we need to see how we can become revolutionaries. Devenir révolutionnaire. Sans la révolution. How can we become revolutionaries without any immediate prospect of revolution? And that's what he suggests. And he suggests that this process of becoming a minority, even though, I think quantitatively, if we think of the global population, residues are the majority. But if we're thinking about politics rather than demographics, then becoming a minority is the best we can do. That we have to understand how we can become minorities together, how we can formulate major projects together by being minorities united, how we can act within and against the majority community as selective minorities, as alternative thinkers, with horizons that are stretched. And we can pass it on to our kids as well. I think that's very important. So our kids don't become little reactionaries. It's terribly important in England. There's many, many little Englanders around. And actually trying to socialize a young child into not being one, and I'm sure that goes across the board pretty much everywhere, is rather difficult. So there's a job to think about how we can become minorities together. How we can trouve les agencements mondiaux is how Deleuze puts it at the end. Find the projects, the global projects together that we can assert on minorities and we can do together. We can do it small because we know how to think big. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Andy.